but it might be less uh, nuisance, I guess, if he gets some of the storm on. But 90% of the rains are not the big rain events right. either. Yep. So it's, and I think, yeah, so if it just did it once every two years or once every four years, that's not going to be a problem for erosion, I don't think. Maybe it would be. Is there a constant flow out there? Do you always see I mean, like right now? Because the creek that is yeah. running, yeah. the spring is going. It's going, right? It is spring yeah. event. Yeah. Yeah. There's a flow out there. In fact, right you can now. see it run in the wintertime, but you know, yeah. as it really gets cold, it just kind of layers. It's yeah. the deepest I've seen it until about eight years ago. When either because we had built up around here or the diverted the water was diverted, and that's when things began to cut down. For 30 years that I lived there, our kids could tiptoe across that creek any time in the midst of the rainstorm. So something changed about eight years ago. A lot more water began to come out of that. Drain. A lot more rainstorm. The last few years have had wet years. And, and that the drainage under Edgewood was not made adequate, even though it was recently replaced, relatively recently, what, three, five years? The culvert camp. It's talking about right, right here. Yeah, so it just backs up behind that area. That's what really flooded the last time. Yeah, we had water half, uh, probably a third of the way up our yard, one rain, as it just backed up that whole, there was a big lake in there. Crazy. I think it got beyond this easement line, though. I mean, that's what it's intended it didn't. for. Yeah. No, I didn't. That's what it's I don't know if it didn't. Hundred years should stay. Uh, we had a log that floated up on our lawn that I couldn't lift. Now, I'm not sure it was not beyond <laughs> the easement line. But I'll bet you here it's had a better opportunity. We're further up, so it may not have there. But well, we're right here. Yeah. And I, I honestly don't know exactly how far it came up. But I couldn't, you know, it was above everything that we had in the yard. So it was considerably. Well, you realize all the trees and the logs and limbs, all that will aid in obstructing the flow and it will keep the back. living trees. So keep the erosion from occurring. That's true. That's true. So here we are. <laughs> we got the older trees, we got the young. <laughs> when all the building was done up above where this, our, this side, when right all then. the building was done up here, the city could have gone right into the village, she could have gone right along here and down into the river and still came. Yeah, yeah. yeah it well, seems to be given the, the flow of it. You know, two, two approaches. One would cut down some of the water that's running into it on the storm. And not destroy And try to, uh, I don't know, by, I don't know how you control erosion along the stream, but I believe with a number of step dams, you can actually keep erosion and refill behind those step dams. They would be beautiful if they were made of, uh, if they were just suit quartz. I think. The crack poured in there. When there's a constant flow, like that spring flow you're talking about, one of the best options is to have a pipe, though, just to contain that one, that trickle flow, that continually well, the road, the beauty of the ecology that we no, live in. We don't want a pipe. We don't want our tree, we don't our tree put in. No, I got, no, we're talking about small. We don't want a pipe at all. Don't want any pipe. No. That's why we bought it. Because Why a do you think we were there? You don't want a pipe. Yeah, there's probably only three the creeks at all. Yeah. Under the street. Exactly. We don't want a pipe. The reason we bought, we lived two blocks over, my husband and I, until two years ago. And in the entire time, the entire six years we lived there, we coveted this neighborhood and waited to get a house here because of the trees and the creek. And there's almost no place else in Sioux Falls that has anything like this. You know, and, and that's why we bought it. Not because we wanted a ditch in our backyard or just a big ravine. We wanted the creek. We wanted the giant, With the trees. lovely trees. Yeah. The yeah. Trees. And almost if everybody... There were trees, we actually have lived there 38 years. And 38 years ago, there were trees along the street. So that was one of the reasons we bought one of the few areas in Sioux Falls that we found that had trees and birds. And now we've got a brown hog. I don't know if that's a benefit or a attraction. But, well, let's go back way back in time, before 38 years. Okay. They built this. They put a drainage easement in there. We 
we have an ordinance that says we have to keep this ordinance, we have to keep this easement clear of all obstruction, we got to keep this clear of all obstructions for our drainage flow. Well, then let's move up in time, 38 years, trees, homeowners came in and started planting trees. Now, wait a minute, those trees were there 38 well, years ago. Well, that's from the very beginning, though, were the trees there when they cleared this out. Oh, I'm sure they that were, is because trees grow along the streams, and the stream's been there. I don't know how long the spring has been there, but I would bet that there were trees. If I could ask. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll open it back up to the open house again after it's doing a Sure. Could I get a copy of that list, everybody? Yep. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm kind of the one. We can go all fired up already. I know, I'm like, did I hear y'all? Yeah. One for coming tonight. I'm Andy Berg with the City Engineering Department. I'm the principal drainage engineer for the city. Um, we've got a great turnout tonight. I appreciate all of you coming. Uh, I know there's been some concern and confusion about maybe what is happening in this area. Uh, we're here tonight to describe where things are at, uh, what the purpose of the meeting is tonight, and then uh, we'll open it back up to an open house format where we can uh, take questions and concerns of your individual properties at these boards. We've got a lot of people here tonight besides myself. Um, Jeff Delores with the City Engineering Department, Dina Knudsen, she's the project manager, Chad Hanish, Aaron Fagerness, Matt Pyle with Howard R. Green, and Phil Gunvalson with Howard R. Green, and Krista May with Howard R. Green in the back, and Carrie Ellis with the engineering department on the drainage team as well. And tonight also, Councillor Aguilar is here as well. So, um, first, I wanted to start off by saying tonight is a fact-finding meeting. We're, we're, we have not designed anything to be done in this channel yet. This is strict, strictly to gather the folks that live along here, get your input on these comment cards, find out what is extremely important to each of you that live on here. Uh, so we have a better idea of do we need to just minimize any impacts to this? Do we need to do, uh, there's any number of different improvements that could be done or staying out of there completely, obviously that's an option that we would also look at. I know a lot of people have already mentioned that to me, but <laughs> what, what we want is the comment cards are extremely important to us because it, it, we can't remember everything we're told tonight. We want you to be very descriptive on it. Um, Phil will touch on that as well, but if you don't want it, please tell us why. You, uh, you like the natural stream, you like the trees there, you like X, Y, Z of why you like it, also, what you'd be open to if we did need to come into that area. Would you be open to native grasses or different ideas that you have for what you'd like to see in there if you have things you think need to be taken out of the channel? So anything and everything that you feel for this channel, please put it on the comment cards and send those back to us or turn them in tonight or email or call us, you know, any of those options. Tonight is to get as much information as we can. What Howard R. Green has done to date is basically they've gone out, surveyed the channel, you've seen they've taken pictures, and they've modeled the channel as it is existing conditions. And that's where we've had them stop. We don't want to spend any money on any design until we've heard from you folks to see what we'll be designing. Um, you know, there, there's a stretch up in this segment here that also has sanitary sewer flowing through it. That's a higher priority because we can't, as we've had other parts of town, we can't have sanitary sewers being uh, exposed and uh, broken or uh, having stormwater flowing into it. So those are some of the concerns as well. But uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil Gunnelson. He'll touch on uh, where we're at, and then we'll open it back up to the open house. Well, as Andy touched on, uh, here's a, a project timeline to date. Uh, again, you mentioned field survey was completed in May 2012. Uh, you all received letters regarding that. Uh, we just wrapped up the analysis of the existing drainage system. 
for the most part, we found that the existing drainage model showed a 100 year event, which is what the city's uh, standard is, is primarily maintained within that existing easement area along that back lot line, which is good. Uh, so another thing that, that we would want you to show or list on your comment cards would be any localized drainage concerns you may have on your property. Uh, certain folks have different, different issues, different drainage issues uh, on their individual properties. We're here today with public meeting number one. Uh, and then we've kind of got a tentative schedule here that, that you know, is our goal, uh, but this will vary depending on what solution, if any, is implemented. Uh, so in August to September, we received the feedback from the comment cards. Uh, we'll summarize all those comments. Uh, the city, along with HR Green, uh, will look at those and try to identify uh, several improvements that could be implemented uh, in different areas throughout the channel. Uh, and then those options will be brought back to this group again, and we'll have a meeting such like this or uh, notified in some other manner, uh, hopefully in the September, October time frame. And then once a proposed solution is determined, we will begin proceeding with design, and then throughout design, uh, we meet with every homeowner one-on-one -on -one generally at your individual residence uh, to discuss that proposed improvement and how it relates to your individual property. Uh, a tentative bid date, we'd like to bid a project, if there is a project, uh, in the early spring of next year with uh, construction uh, next summer. So again, as Andy mentioned, comment cards, data gathering is the big item tonight. Be as descriptive as possible. Uh, any issues, no matter how small or how large you think they might be, please list them on your comment card. Uh, and then also be sure to sign in, give us your name, address, phone number, uh, because we'll be contacting all of you to set up those individual property owners at some point in the future. Email is very important. That's usually one of the best ways to get a quick response from any of us. Uh, so as Andy mentioned, the rest of the night, uh, we'd like to have people disperse to the boards, grab any one of us, and we'll uh, answer any questions you have as they relate to your property. We can also uh, write some comments right there on the board because uh, I don't think we all have time to sit up here and listen to everybody's questions. I don't think we'd get out of here. Um, yeah. I'm lucky to come in with this late. I have no idea what the problem is with the economy solution. I'm sorry, I meant to touch on that a little bit. Um, you know, we've taken, we've taken some pictures in the area, uh, just kind of showing some of the concern we have, but the, the trees falling down in this channel as they're undermined. The erosion, uh, you, you're getting vertical slopes on these channels that are, one, that start to migrate further into this waterway as the water goes through this property. You get trees that the roots get undermined, they tip over, and when they're tipping over, you get, you, depending on the size, you have the danger of hitting structures or homes, and then uh, also, depending on the size, if they fall over and they aren't removed, then they're washing down the channel and they're plugging up the culverts downstream. So that, that's a big part of it. There's safety with the you know the vertical slopes on the on the channel. You know, just for people, if they happen to be back there, you know, that's a fall hazard. That's it's, it's something that we need to worry about as well. And then I mentioned the sanitary sewer on the north segment. That's a concern of ours as well. Those are the, the big things that are, are of concern to us. That's that's stuff that's been a concern of ours. Right. Since we've been there, we've been there 16 years. Yeah, and I've taken calls from various folks about the tree issue, and you know, it's one neighbor wants to take care of it themselves, another wants the city to come in and take care of it because our water's causing it, and that's a. Uh, uh, balancing act and that's part of what this project is you know the feedback we get helps dictate maybe where we go with that you know that decision on private or public
because it's, I'm sure if I had if I had to climb those trees or have somebody do that, cut down 80 foot cottonwood trees, mm -hmm. um, it cost me eight, ten thousand dollars. Yeah, it just we had two removed and I think it was five thousand dollars, and they didn't have to top both of them. So it that's the toughest part. The the really tall trees. You can't just bring an excavator in and rip it down or cut it down and let it fall. You have to, the arborists have to go in and top them and take them down from the top down. So. And, and one of the problems is these, these problems are sporadic. They're here and there. And that property owner wants that fixed. So the, the, the property owner in between is another problem. And if he doesn't want you cramping over his property to get to the other guy's property, I don't want mine trampled on to just to fix her problem. Certainly. And so that's, um, how you, you, you could have two yeah. entirely separate groups here at odds with each other, like where the where the uh, yeah. erosion is really bad on one side, the guy on that side wants that fix. Certainly. I want an erosion. The guy on the other side has got a nice, a nice big uh, area now. And that's so, that's the difficult part for the city. It's got to be. It, you know, we, we, we never do a project that doesn't have opposition whether it's a large amount or a small amount. Um, our elected officials, our directors, they have to make some of those tough decisions sometime on which side of this group are we going to go with. And that's a lot of that feedback so we're hoping to get tonight, you know, to see what the general feedback is from the comment cards, what concerns people have themselves versus what we've seen out there as potential issues. Andy, have you had a project where you've been able to get the neighbors to come together to get a solution that works for everyone. Because I, we don't want this to be a they win, they lose, and we're against each other. We want to get people's concerns addressed, yet maintain the natural beauty of that area, uh, plus the property values of that area as well. Is, is there, have you had some projects like this in town where you have got a win-win versus neighbor against neighbor? Sure. Uh, there's varying levels, but yes, I mean, you know, that that's also what I, I mentioned earlier. Tell us things that you'd be open to, you know, on your comment card. If, if we end up deciding, you know what, we've got to go into this area, maybe planting new trees on the easement edge or doing different types of control structures in the channel, native grasses versus uh, short grasses, all those things are things that hopefully even though you didn't like it, maybe you're going to get some nice trees and a, a natural appearance with still the water flowing through there in the end. Um, those are the things where we have to balance. And yeah, we certainly, you know, when we have those individual property owner meetings, a lot of times that's the things we discuss too is, you know, you're going to have significant impact on your property. You know, this is what we need to do. You know, what can we do to, you know, hopefully make you hole in this. Now, obviously there's limitations on how much we can do as well, but uh, that we, it's certainly our intent to tell people through this that aren't uh, in favor of it if we do need to go down the road of regrading that channel. Which would... If you'd like us to write down suggestions of what we're comfortable with, would it be appropriate for you to go through some of the options that are available to us so that we all know what options are available before we start listing them? That would that'd be difficult. I, there are a lot, you know, trees is an easy one. You know, planting of trees along the, the easement line uh, to help with getting that screening back so you've got trees instead of the next door neighbor's deck looking at you. Um, a lot of different landscape type stuff. You know, uh, there's always a possibility that we look at putting a low flow pipe through there which takes the water flow off, but I guess that's an unpopular opinion. But that's another solution that some people uh, may like. You know, um, natural grasses, uh, we, you can plant them that get two to three feet high and have flowering on them. You know, it's always going to have water flowing through there unless we pipe it. So we're going to have to reinforce that to try and keep this from eroding right back to the way it was. So uh, we have to put if we do it, if we do it similar to the Tomar channel, to the west of you folks, southwest of you, um, that one we had to do a lot of blanketing. Seeded it and then blanketed it so the seed grows up through there and that blanket holds the soil tight underneath. 
Um, there's an example down uh, towards the very north end where we, uh, somebody in the past, I don't know if it's a city a long time ago, or residents put in gabion baskets, which are basically a, a wire baskets that are full of rock. It isn't necessarily beautiful, but it serves the purpose. It still gives it a somewhat natural look, and you can get uh, things growing up through those sometimes, cover them with dirt and seed them. So, that's some, there are many more. Uh, I guess my thought would be put your ideas on there, whatever they may be, and we'll, we'll talk to you about if that's feasible or not. Oftentimes people, uh, the bank cuts back and it's cutting into their property, or maybe the channel's not centered in the easement anymore, so it's eroded back to one side of the property. So with the proposed improvement, they may have an additional 15 feet of backyard now, so it might be something like that. I, I don't hear anything about an alternative to the stream bed uh, about the city putting drainage under the road. I mean, I don't understand when everything was developed and everything was paved over and we had all this extra runoff, there was no attempt made that I'm aware of to increase the carrying the drainage off, which could have been done under the street in an appropriate way and never get to the creek bed. This drainage channel is comprised of about 96 acres. It's generally all within the, the Tothill area. It generally extends east towards Thunderbird and it has some of 49th Street and then the area itself. Right. Uh, so. All we can assume is 50 years ago when this was designed, you know, this was one development, the Tuthill Park Hills development, and the storm sewer system and that drainage channel was designed at that time. What we do know it was designed correctly at that time. What we do know is that the future developments uh, south of 49th Street and all those, you know, they're they're in a separate system. They're not coming through here. So there's not a, a thought about enlarging the <clears throat> drainage? Well, like I mentioned, the existing drainage analysis that, that we performed uh, shows that that channel section that's currently in there is carrying the capacity of water that it needs to. What, what, would, what would possibly be a solution to the erosion of the channel is more of, like I said, that low flow pipe. If we can bury a low flow pipe basically under the entire channel that conveys the smaller storm events because what erosion is typically caused by is the constant wet soil and that water cutting in there. So you have all your everyday water flowing through that pipe and then the channel above ground would carry the larger rain events. But uh, the, the drainage, like Phil said, the 100 year flow just on our modeling and folks can certainly tell us in your comment cards if the water is getting outside the easement, but generally the model shows the water stays within the easement area, so it's still functioning as a design as far as the amount of water it conveys and gets down to the river. So. My wife and I just moved into this neighborhood from right on Cliff Avenue two years ago, and the only reason we moved into that neighborhood was because of the natural creek and the trees that existed and we didn't actually know there was an easement at the time. Um, if those trees are removed in that easement, it creates a 60 foot void um, of sort of anything in the future, it sounds like. And it seems like the, the problem is caused directly by the three foot storm drain that's at the top of the creek. And I, I respect everybody that's had problems with, and the tallies, our neighbors have had trees fall in, and that's a really tough thing to deal with. But it would, it would seem like if what Mrs. Tally said, burying a, a drain under Otonka, you'd sort of eliminate the cause of a lot of the erosion problems that exist for, for people's trees falling in. And, and yet you, you keep that natural beauty that exists in you know, relatively few neighborhoods in all of Sioux Falls. That uh, that we 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 moved in for, and I would assume a lot of people moved in for. You're talking bearing a pipe down the street alignment. Yeah. That would be fairly difficult because of the 
change in elevation of the street. The, the amount of just trench size itself and the depth of the pipe uh, would become a problem. Um, and you would still end up putting anything over the design event would still naturally flow to this point. Yeah. It, would, it would function as the low flow pipe would in the sense that the normal everyday flows would go through that pipe and just the bigger storm events would still go through the channel. But that would be very difficult to do. Uh, just because, you know, when you look at your driveway and then the bottom of the channel and the back side, it's, I don't know how many foot of drop, but it's quite a bit. But from the top here where it enters, that's relatively downhill all the way down Otonka. Right, yeah, it drops down. You're right. Um, it is, but these drop structures right here, those are roughly 17, 18 feet deep. And that pipe is down there. So you're starting to begin with. Yeah. I'll say this. Uh, we're not going to rule anything out. That's something <laughs> we'll certainly have HR Green look at and see how deep it would have to be in Tomar. It's not a di difficult thing to figure out. And then how much that would require taking out. Um, so, yeah. so with the low flow pipe, take away the, the crick completely then? Or would it, it would take it away until it was a inch plus inch plus rain. And then you'd maybe get some water flowing down through it. It would just be runoff still, right? Is what it you're would saying? just be runoff during a storm event. You wouldn't have the, I think there, except maybe this year, and every day flow going through that channel. I've seen many areas where they use large rocks to border an area like that to prevent erosion. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that would allow us to keep the running water, which we appreciate the beauty. Uh, I don't think many people would mind using some of these big cottonwoods that Mother Nature planted right. and have caused problems. But um, if we could just get rid of the major trees that cause the problem and life with rock, that solve most of the problems. Rip wrap is what we call it, the rock. Um, that is what we do in a lot of places, and it's certainly one of the options available to us. Uh, basically, you'd have to, you'd still have to put a little bit of slope on the chan on it so that the rock would stay put. But yeah, that's certainly an option. Now, I would guess there's probably people in the room that don't want rock in there as well. So that's just another balancing act. But that's a very effective way, and that's. Uh, what we do on other channels throughout town is use the riprap to slow that water down and keep it from eroding quite as bad. You made reference to the Tomar project. How is this? Is this similar <coughs> to some of the issues that they were dealing with? It is similar, and they don't. They had worse erosion, but the channel also carries a mag, order of magnitude higher of flow. Okay. So it was a much bigger project, much bigger disturbed area, you know, the void, as you referred to it, was much bigger because of the high volumes of water going through there, but in in the scope of it is the same, yes, there's water coming but through. But not the scale. Okay. Correct. It also had sanitary yeah. sewer. That's true. The sanitary was throughout the entire channel there, whereas this one is just from Edgewood to the Tudhill Park entrance. Yes. I'm, I'm just not... Uh, understanding Andrew exactly. Uh, we've actually lived at 1305 uh, I'm Robert Talley uh, of Cedar Lane okay. for 38 years I think. And for 30 years while the stream ran all the time uh, we didn't have the erosion. And I, I can remember my children growing up could uh, walk across that stream directly from the banks and if we weren't looking, they wouldn't step on the rocks but walk in the water, which was about three inches deep. It's only been in the last eight years that suddenly there's been huge flows through that channel. So it's hard for me to believe that the stream is the culprit. Um, that is the daily flow, because we've watched it flow for 38 years. I have really, uh, you know, my own 
prejudice is <laughs> that it's the storm flow that has caused all the damage, that has underlined the trees, that I watched cut away the bank in the back of my yard, and you can see that picture there, which we have tried to put rickrack in at times on our own to try to hold down, and there are some min mini dams mm -hmm. uh, in that area. So again, I think the problem to be addressed is the extent of storm flow and not the fact that we luckily, luckily, have a uh, spring-fed stream running through our backyards. Yeah, the, as you saw the last couple of years, uh, you know, and we don't know if it's a global change or what, but we, we seem to be getting a lot more high-intensity rain events. You know, they used to call them 100-year storms, and now for obvious reasons you don't call them that because <laughs> it doesn't happen every 100 years. But since about 2004 through last year, we get five to seven inch rains, and unfortunately, those kickstart a lot of these things. And then the stream flow, right, it, it may not have been the starter, it's just unfortunately, once erosion has started, it helps gnaw away at it. Um, the, the basin hasn't changed, you know, it, it'd be one thing if a new development went in just upstream and was flowing through without any detention. But this whole area has basically been unchanged for the most part. You know, houses have been built for quite some time now. So all we have to look at is the higher intensity of rainfall events that we've gotten now and how we can wrangle that flow and keep it from making this situation even worse. Whether it is a pipe down Otonka, which I said might be difficult, but we'll look at. Or it's riprap structures in the channel bottom that just help slow that water down and drop it. And you know, there's there's a lot of options out there, but I don't disagree. The storm flows and these high intensity rain events are what really aggravate that erosion. Real preliminary type question on this. So whether it's some sort of association type If the city goes in and does the project that's a city capital improvement project that we fund, if the consensus is that nobody wants the city to go in there, we would have to go back to the residents and ask them to do some improvements so that we don't get our systems plugged up or cause flooding of a, an owner or something along those lines. We would have to work with the folks to try and figure out how we're going to protect homes and uh, make sure that the dangers aren't out there. But yeah, if it's if we went in and did work, it would be city funded. What's your taxpayer budget? What's the budget for this? Do we have any idea? I'm sure you know, we don't have a plan yet. But well, what this is just what in. Talking about? It's it's in the capital improvement project called uh, drainage channel improvements, which is a pool project that has multiple locations in it. So the dollar amounts can fluctuate based on what the designs end up being. We can just move projects out if necessary, or add in if we don't have a high expense. <coughs> I think this gentleman's next. You know, uh, we live right at the end of all this training, so I understand there, we give it all. Mm -hmm. And the Canadians you were talking about um, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the three of us got together, we tried the riprap, and it's all down in the river. So that didn't work. But we, uh, the three of us, agreed we got to do something because we had lost, we had lost about 17 feet of our backyard. The neighbor had lost some of his, and we'd gotten to the point where it was about 25 feet deep. That's where the gate. We paid for it ourselves, mm -hmm. and and it does work. It was held except now my wall collapsed, and I got to start over again. But. It's a lifetime project. But I will say this, you can get along with your neighbors if you get together. It cost us about 12, 13,000 to get those Canadians put in. There's, I don't know how many, there's 400 and some ton of rock we put in and it's all filled with these Canadians and they've held. They've said they stayed there real good. I put the railroad ties in to make a wall so I could get my 
So, um, and it's expensive, but if, if the neighbors all get together, you can do it. We don't want to lose a creek. We didn't want to lose a creek. Mm -hmm. So we did it ourselves. But uh, the riprap, at least we've never been able to get it to hold. The gavians do. Okay. They're expensive, but they do work. Yeah, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, and, and everything from my uh, south lot line all the way to the end of the city property is all gavian. We've covered it with dirt and planted grass back over it. But, um, okay. That day it works. We didn't ask the city because we didn't want it covered up. We didn't want a big culvert in there. Sure. But um, riprap, I've never been able to get it to hold, but we get everything. <laughs> right. When it's all done draining from everybody else's, and we could whitewater crew, canoe from his, his <laughs> water right over the river if, if yeah. we were good enough. Yeah. <laughs> the riprap, uh, obviously, size matters. You know, well, the Tomar like, Channel, we've got rocks yeah. this big, and yeah. they'll stay, but you they aren't necessarily as nice looking. You know, that is so. correct. You are right about that. You get the great big ones, and they stay in place, but the little 200 pounders. Right. They'll tend to roll. Yes. So, when we get to that path, we keep the trees. That's all needs to be looked at with the design. Um, it, it's certainly. It, same with the Tomart project. You know, people came to us and said, "We want these trees kept." We did everything we did could to shift alignments and keep the trees they wanted. There were a lot of scrub trees that nobody wanted. Someone wanted them out of there. So, you know, like this uh, lady said, the cottonwoods. A lot of people don't like those. Well, we can't just go in and pluck that cottonwood when there's a tree right next to it that might tip over as well. Uh, we have to clear, if we're, if we go in and do it, we have to clear the trees out that are in the grading limits, basically, to do the rock. But there's a lot of play in there. There's a lot of different things that can be done. I would just ask you on your comment cards, spell out exactly what, you know, I live at this address. I have five trees in my backyard. I don't want to lose one of them because uh, I don't think this, that, or the other thing. Just tell us that, you know. That's that's where we start. Well, <laughs> certainly. Yep. Just it, as descriptive as you can be. Um, Phil and Andy mentioned that we ran the existing model that said that it all works through there. That model doesn't take into account trees, and so those are obstructions in there. The model is basically built with a neat channel existing channel that's out there, it doesn't take into account all the obstructions that are there. So when we say the model works, it's assuming that everything's out of the way. So if things aren't out of the way, we can't guarantee that all that flow is staying within that easement area. And uh, one thing that we wanted to mention too is a lot of that tree clearing is just necessary to get the equipment and a truck in there to bring the rock in a lot of times. So it isn't necessarily that that tree was undermining or was going to tip over or was blocking flow because the project may need to get a truck in there with rock or something. That's another reason a tree may need to go. Uh, I just say that so you're aware of why sometimes it's a corridor versus just a tree here and there. So. I'm wondering about Dr. Talley's comment. Um, I live at 1508 Otaka, right on that point, kind of. Okay. And when it rains really hard, I see Amy back there, we get water coming down the street. It comes between our two houses. It jumps down our steps. So I'm wondering if really it isn't more of a storm sewer issue that we need something bigger than just this little creek because it's coming down the street in between our two houses. And the cooks and us put rock between our two houses last summer to stop it. And then of course it doesn't rain, so they don't have to work. But, <laughs> but that's what we did to prevent that. <laughs> Some of that is, you know, the, there's, a, there's a, a low point in the street right here with inlets in it. So 
it, what our design standards say is in a five-year storm, which is a, there's a certain amount per hour in a book that uh -huh. says that's a five-year event, that water gets to that low point and should all go into the inlets and flow through the pipe. And if you get a storm that rains more than that design event, then it's conveyed over land, whether it's this way or if you get out of that low point, and then it's down along the channel yeah, all this way. And it probably gets down to probably that low point there, is my guess. Um, but our yards were saturated, and sure. then in between, it just went down the down the steps right. down to the creek. The only the only thing that we could really do in an instance like that, because the water that comes to you probably isn't getting over here. It's probably starting at some point coming down the side street. I don't know for sure, but you know. You can add an inlet on the street, but then you have to run a pipe somewhere to get it back into the channel. But uh, please comment but on that. that. Would, that's something yeah. to look yeah, that's at. the type of thing that we like to hear. Because things like that, if there is a project, it could possibly be incorporated. Mm -hmm. Even if you can say the water was up to my step or up to this joint in my pavement or whatever it might be, that gives us a better feel for how much on Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, take, uh, I'll take two more questions and then I think I'd like to break it up and let people, because some people aren't comfortable talking in front of a group, they can approach us at one of these boards, talk to us individually, and then uh, once again I'll stress, please get those comment cards filled out, tell us anything and everything. Yes, sir? Um, I thought about John and um, he said that we could cure a problem with check dams that have been done in you know, all over the Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the engineer is in the book. You know, I think I had to put a check dam and the other side will come back and have a check dam. So the deer is going about that long time. Sure. So the engineer is here. We don't really have to run the D9. Please write that on the comment card, but I'll, I will address it to some extent. Uh, check dams we use many places throughout town because they do exactly that. They, they stop the water when it's starting to gain momentum, slow it down, and then they make it spill over. And a lot of times, you can drop it down lower to make the next channel a little flatter. Uh, it doesn't necessarily address the danger of trees that are already undermined and some of those vertical slopes, but uh, certainly that's not something we'll look at when we're doing this, when we're looking at the options. Well, once we have all of your input, uh, we discuss it internally with uh, my boss is the city engineer and Jeff is assistant city engineer. Uh, we discuss the impacts both ways. Um, from there, you know, we we put together our solutions. You know, the, before the uh, on that timeline, we say, okay, this is one of the probably with like three options, and then we come back to the neighborhood, at another public meeting. We say these are the things that we think should be done, and one of them is going to be some sort of low impact or no impact. Uh, that will you know will explain what each of those involves, what the uh, impacts are to the neighborhood, and and go from there. You know we'll get your input again once we have some solid uh, engineering thought behind it. So. What about the damage that the coming through? I spent a couple thousand dollars putting the bylock bushes and ferns. I guess one part of that would be where it is. If it's in the easement, that's something we don't. We need. We you know the easement gives us the right to go in there. But yes, certainly, it, 
let me know where it is, what it was, and uh, we'll talk to you about any damage to that. Last one. I have a question. A lot of our trees were marked with blue paint. Are, is that the process of, are those the trees that you are proposing to get rid of, or why did you do that? The surveyors, when they were out there shooting the individual trees, they put a blue dot on the trees that they'd already shot, just so they knew just that, an that they collected it. It doesn't indicate doesn't removal indicate or keep, it's just an inventory so they knew that they shot every tree. And were those within the, the 30 foot easement? Correct, most of them. Yeah, yeah. And also, a lot, I've had a lot of questions about some pink sticks up in, up in yards. People have been asking if that was the easement payment line or maybe the property line. Those are neither. As of right now, they were just simple control points that the surveyors were using to set their equipment on where they had a good line of sight to survey in a lot of the features. And one thing we're yeah. planning to do before the follow-up meeting when we have more discussion about impacts is going out and actually setting stakes on the easement line so that everyone knows where that easement line truly is. So the next meeting you come in and we say, well, this option involves doing this out to the easement line. You've at least seen it in your backyard and know roughly where that easement line falls on your property. But we're not going to do that until probably a day or two or three before the next public meeting because otherwise kids and whatever else, they're a very attractive thing for people to pull out of the ground and get rid of. So. The stakes you can pull, there's probably an iron pin below it. Uh, it'd be nice if you can keep the iron pin there. It's a control point that helps them dial in. Yeah, the iron pin should be flush with the ground, so you should be able to mull over it and everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, We'll be around at all the different boards here. Uh, just feel free to approach us with any additional questions. Otherwise, thank you very much, and uh, please fill out those cards.